Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome back to the course Decoding Comic Studies and Reading Graphic Narratives in 21st Century India. So, in the last lecture what we saw that we took two important graphic novels, the one uh, The Dark Knight Returns, Batman in fact and the second one was Watchman and we saw that what they did to, did to, uh, what they, did, they too did to the uh, uh, to the graphic novels and how uh, graphic novels were changed and uh, people started looking at the superheroes comics very differently. After talking about the practice right what I did in the last lecture because I thought it has become a lot of theory and we have been uh, just uh, talking the abstract things. Uh, it is also time to talk something uh, that uh, relates to you in the sense that something that you have been waiting for let us say for example, uh, text right. So, because we all know that it is not always a theory, but it is also sometime practice which is required right. So, and also it does not make sense if we have been listening and we are not applying. However, I tried most that whenever I am explaining something, I can show you some visuals and I can explain what I am speaking through the visuals. I have how it is applied on uh, uh, comic uh, art right. So, now what I am going to do in this lecture today going to tell you the advanced comic theories and criticism right. The one that I talked about uh, theory it was uh, more that how it is started with, but after a point of time as you see we are living in a world where everything is changing so fast, lot of things are happening, lot of things are being changed, lot of things are being transformed and every day we are uh, meeting with something new, everything we are being challenged by something new understanding, new epistemology, new ontology. So, now what is the job of is to catch them right to go and make a pace with them so that we should not run behind. So, that is why the keeping in the mind when I thought that I have finished these two and I planned okay, now it is a time to introduce you to advanced comic theory and criticism. So, dear students what I will do, I will introduce you uh, to some theoreticians who are talking about comic art or let graphic novels and I will talk details about them and I will keep referring to them for and their works in detail right. I will talk about the work in details and what you need to do is to just pick up a pen and paper keep noting down because everything will be visible on your screen. So, whenever something I am showing it to you obviously, I will give you time you do not need to uh, all constantly pause the video and listen then pause the video and listen. What I will do? I will give you the time and uh, everything that is important information will be shown to you on your screen. So, just note it down then so that whenever the course ends like obviously, we have couple of lectures more to go when the course ends you can think and revise properly and if you want to uh, do something in this uh, in this uh, field comic studies field or let us say you want to read comic arts or you want to know and be familiar it will help you out all right. So, without wasting much of your time let us go back to the slides. Now, you see that uh, here we have uh, 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 someone Hillary shoots right. You can uh, note down the name right. So, here you see that uh, uh, Hillary shoots and when we have Charles Hatfield very important people and then we have Hannah just a second I will uh, write it down for you Hannah Mudrag. All right, 
and then we have Barbera Postema, right? And then we have Neil Cohn and others, right? So, who discuss respectively about contemporary graphic narratives, alternative comics, linguistic issues, right? We have not else like talk in detail, and then we have narrative structure in comics, cognitive aspects of a comics, right? So, what we are going to do in uh, we are what we are going to discuss in this lecture is uh, uh, linguistic aspects as well and cognitive aspects as well alternative comics right and con and narrative structure so this will this lecture is intended to introduce you to the basic ideas discussed by men's and critics right these are the critics and uh, help you understand the advancement that have a uh, been made in comics theory after the likes of Scott McCloud and Will Asner and let us say for example, Theory Granstein, Bart Beatty and Spiegelman among others alright. So, here we have Hilary Shoot is an American scholar and an expert on comics and graphic narratives. She was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1976. She is a currently a distinguished professor of uh, English and Art Design at Northeastern University. She was formerly an associate professor in the Department of English and the University of Chicago and a visiting professor at Howard University. Right? So, Schutz is the author of uh, several books including uh, look at this graphic women, life narrative and contemporary comics right as you could see that and then we have another one disaster drawn uh, visual witness comics and documentary form that came out in 2016 you see and 2010 this one uh, graphic women came in 2010 and uh, uh, a disaster drawn came out in 2016. She has also written numerous articles and essays on comics and graphic narratives. So, she is a leading figure in the field of a comic theory and has helped to define the emerging field of a graphic narrative. She has interviewed several prominent comic book artists and writers including Scott McCloud and Daniel Klaus. Suits is a co-editor of uh, graphic subjects, critical essays on autobiography and graphic novels. Her work focuses on how the form of a comics right endeavor to express history particularly war generated histories she has also explored the intersection of a comics and autobiography as well as the role of a comics in documentary form her research has been widely published right uh, in uh, academic journals uh, including modern fiction studies and Rutgers English. Now, the title of uh, Hilary Suits uh, November 19 lecture in 2007 out of the gutter contemporary graphic novels by women. I would recommend you to read this out of the gutter contemporary graphic novels by women has a double meaning. It refers to the elevation of a graphic narratives comics from the lowest most disreputable level of artistic expression of a form worthy of a New York Times best seller down, literary prizes and academic attentions. It also refers to the something seemingly far more mundane, the empty space separating the framed drawing in a graphic narrative, literally the gutter. For shoot, whose talk was delivered as the Radcliffe Institute, uh, so lecture, the relationship between gutter and frame represents a counterpoint between presence and absence, right? delineating the boundaries of what can be shed and what can be shown in a graphic narrative. She earned a PhD in English from Rutgers University in 2006 with a dissertation titled Contemporary Graphic Narratives, History, Aesthetics and Ethics. Her interest in comics began when she read Art Spiegelman Mosh, right? A survivor's tale just now uh, we discussed it. 
in a graduate class on contemporary fiction totally blown away by Spiegelman's graphic narrative as she described her response in an interview in a Rutgers alumni publication. She was nice since like she has since written extensively about Spiegelman's work. Her criticism caught the attention of the artist himself and they collaborated on a book about Spiegelman's work called Metamos that came out in <coughs> 2011. The interesting, the, what is interesting about her work that you can see that she was highly influenced by Art Spiegelman and now you can see that we extensively dealt with Art Spiegelman's work boss that influenced her to do or to build a career in uh, a comic studies and graphic novels, right. Second important thing why I picked up the women uh, as a because her contribution is the most uh, I mean the most in the sense that the way she contributed is extremely uh, noticeable and uh, so far we have been reading, thinking, feeling about the men is the first time we are meeting a woman who has uh, contributed a lot and in fact Hilary Schutz contribution can be uh, can can can, is, uh, can never be ignored and therefore we are uh, reading more on her right so that is why i gave you a kind of a biography about her obviously not exact uh, everything about her but something that is noticeable about her so once the lecture is over i would suggest you that keep some uh, get some books by her and read on it all right so look at the slides and you see that in her talk she focused on two recent graphic narratives by women, more memoir than novels, Persepolis, the story of a childhood that came out in 2003 by Marjan Strapi, right, as you could see here, sorry, that you could see here on the screen, right. And then like the 1992, uh, I mean sorry, and there is another one, The Fun Home a family tragic comic right by Alison Bechdel which we already have uh, talked about in fact we discussed about fun home a family tragic comic in detail about Alison Bechdel. Like the 1992 uh, Pulitzer Prize winning Mosh uh, which relates Spiegelman's father's experience as a concentration camp victim in Nazi Germany these more recent narratives employ words and pictures to describe traumatic events. In Persepolis, Shatrapi describes her childhood in Iran uh, during the Islamic revolution and early years of uh, Ayatollah Khamenei dictatorship. In Fun Home, Bechdel, the creator of a lesbian based comic strip called Dykes to Watch Out For, tells of her relationship with her father, a repressed, obsessive, compulsive, closet gay man who suicide when Begdal was 19, right, uh, continues to be a traumatic and haunting event in her life. The reception accorded these books has helped to lift the graphic narratives beyond the pop eclons of a Garfield and Superman into the realm of a serious art uh, capable of dealing with complex human situations and uh, emotions. Persepolis, which garnered the most attention and critical acclaim of any graphic narrative since Moss, has been translated into 20 languages and assigned reading at West Point Academy. An animated version was released in the United States in October with Catherine Deneuve as the voice of the main character's mother. So, Fun Home has also been welcomed enthusiastically by critics spent several weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and was number one of a Time magazine's best book of the year. So, in her talk what she suggested that comics far 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 from being an inherently limited form may be ideally suited to the portrayal of traumatic events and extreme circumstances. Quoting literary theorist Kathy Carruth's pronouncement that to be traumatized is to be possessed by an image or event. She argued 
that by pairing words and images artist may be able to express meaning that could not be conveyed in any other way. In Persepolis for example, Shatterapi's simple stock drawing which had been disparaged by some critiques for their lack of sophistication may express the violence that engulfed Iran in the 1970s and 1980s better than a more realistic depiction. Through its very simplicity, the narrative recognizes the inability of any mode of representation to adequately represent trauma. Likewise, in Fun Home, the style of the drawing which is dense and complex, full of details and juxtapositions that demand sustains attention, conveys the complexity and ambiguity of Bechdel's relationship with her emotionally unavailable father. The sophistication of this narrative's technique contradicts the assumption that visual literacy is replacing verbal literacy and that this process represents an irreplaceable loss for our culture. Spiegelman believes that comics are the last bastion of literacy and that most people do not have the patience to decipher comics. As if in agreement, she said in a 2004 New York Times magazine story on the growing importance of graphic narratives. Comic may be what novels used to be an accessible vernacular form with mass appeal. So, here you see that interestingly what she is arguing right which we have been talking since the very beginning that the difference between novel and graphic novels are not much right. She is making in a point that it can also have a mass appeal the way uh, novels have right. So, look at the slide and you interestingly notice that when we are going through the slide, this is a comic as a literature which I have put it PMLA 2012. So, here her paper comics as a literature right, it was her paper is a comprehensive analysis of the relationship between comics and literature. The paper explores the ways in which comics can be considered a form of a literature and how they can be analyzed using the some critical tools as traditional literary text. The paper begins by defining what is meant by the term comics and how it differs from other forms of visual storytelling such as a film and animation. She argues that comics are a unique form of storytelling that combines both visual and textual elements and that they can be analyzed as a form of literature in their own right. She then goes on to explore the ways in which comics can be analyzed using traditional literary tools such as narrative structure, character development and symbolism. She argued that comics can be read and analyzed in the same way as traditional literary text and that they can be just as complex and nuanced. One of the key argument of the paper is that comics are a form of literature that is uniquely suited to exploring certain themes and ideas. She argues that combination of a visual and textual element in a comics allows for a more immersive and engaging reading experience and that this can be used to explore complex theme such as a trauma, identity, memory and etcetera. So, see for your convenience here I uh, did not suggest comic as literature to be read at house, but I gave you the key uh, argument that was made by Hilary Schutz right. And here you see that is interesting what she is trying to do as the title itself suggests comics as literature. What she is trying to suggest is that comics can be also read like a literature right. You can explore the theme the way you explore the theme in literature. You can look at the character the way you can look at in, in comics and literature. So, it seems she is bringing in fact comics under the domain of literature. So far comics are not included in literature and she is making an attempt to show that comic is nothing but literature. That is a one major point that she made. Second that she is making and that is very interesting which I have been echoing in our in my past lectures is this 
that whenever we are reading this, right? When we are, we are reading this, one thing that we need to understand that that other visual narratives may not be the same the way comics, right? Because it is our tendency to confuse with comic as comic medium with other uh, visual medium and thinking that they can be read in the same way. So the point that she is making that there is a possibility, but saying that comic medium is like other visual medium, that's a wrong statement, right? So keep this in mind, and that is why, for your convenience sake, I brought the key theme that is discussed in comics as literature. However, it is my humble request to you that download this or get it from somewhere and do read it. All right. So going to the slides now, if you see throughout. Uh, the paper she uses a range of examples from both classic and contemporary comics to illustrate her argument. Some of the comics that are discussed in her paper include Moss by Art Spiegelman, right? And now you see uh, the relevance why I discussed Moss, right? Because uh, she, 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 to make her point, she takes, she takes the example from Moss. And, uh, she uses uh, 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 this example, right? Like uh, this, uses Mouse as an example to show how comics can be used to explore complex themes such as uh, trauma and memory, right? So the point is that uh, whenever we have to explore the theme, let's say for example, whether it is a trauma or whether it is a memory or it's a cultural identity or let's say it's a nostalgia or let it it's a uh, domestic abuse or let's say horror, let's say violence. So we read some literature. So the point she is making that these are the uh, textbook available for us where we can uh, explore the same thing. And in fact, she shows that how trauma and memory such a complex issues can also be explored uh, through comics, right? So I think I'm clear what I'm speaking, right? So look at the next slide, please. So, here you see uh, Fun Home by Alison Beckton, which also portrays an example of how comics can be used to explore issues of identity, right, which I have already explained. So, I am sure that you can easily recall and sexuality. Jimmy Corrigan, the smartest kid on the earth and uh, I am sure that we all know is by Chris Ware, right, which she uses as an example of how can be, how comics can be analyzed using traditional literary tools such as narrative structure and symbolism, okay. So Watchmen, just now we discussed uh, in the previous lecture by Alan Moore and then Dave Gibbons, which is discuss an example of how comics can be used to explore. We talked much in detail, so I am not going to speak more on it, political and social issue. Persepolis by uh, Marzane Shatrapi, which is seen as an example of how comics can be used to explore issue of a culture and identity. So, these are just a few examples of the comics that are discussed in comics as a literature. Overall, uh, her paper is a detailed and insightful analysis of the relationship between comics and literature. It provides a compelling argument for the ways in which comics can be considered a form of literature in their own right. It offers a range of tools and technique for analyzing comics using traditional literary method, right. So, here you see that the, the method that is available, uh, traditional literary methods that are available to analyze novels and uh, other uh, literary writings, they are very apt to be used at uh, these uh, 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 graphic novels and comics. In fact, she is making a point that narrative structure can also be noticed here, the way we notice in literature and the cultural identity, one of the important issue. So, see here I have been talking about that how she is vouching for 
that yes comic is a literature and which is why after this attempt made by these thinkers and comic artists what is happening now slowly and gradually in the university's curriculum or syllabi they are including comics as a genre and must be read let us say for example comic medium must be read in details all right so now you can see the significance of this lecture that why i am speaking about these people how they are extremely significant and are making a kind of a contribution in your uh, already understanding of a comic medium all right so look at the slides and see that now we are going to talk about the second one and the one is charles hatfield right and charles hatfield is a prominent scholar in the field of a comic studies he is a professor of english at california state university uh, that is a northridge he is best known for his book comic studies a guide book that was a co-authored with bart bt the book is a comprehensive introduction to the field of uh, right uh, is a comprehensive uh, introduction to the field of a comic uh, a scholarship and covers a wide range of uh, uh, topics related to comics including history theory and criticism it is considered an invaluable resource for both new and veteran comic scholars in addition to this hatfield has contributed to various publication on comics and popular culture including the comic journal the journal of popular culture and the rotless companion to comics right so see uh, one thing more before i move see uh, i have been talking and requesting to you read this for sure and this if possible right and if you get time this one as well so hatfield has made a significant contribution to the study of a children's culture as a teacher he specializes in comic comics children's culture and popular culture studies he has also written extensively on comics and popular culture including work that focuses on children's culture for example in his book hand of a fire that you could see his photo with the book right hand of a fire and here also uh, 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 the name of the book or the cover page you so uh, hatfield explores the way in which kirby's work has influenced the children's culture and the broader cultural landscape additionally hatfield has written about the relationship between comics and childhood arguing that comics are an important part of a children's culture and that they have the power to shape the children's imagination and world views overall hatfield's work has helped establish comic as a legitimate and important uh, uh, part of children's culture and has contribute to broader understanding of the role that popular culture plays in shaping the lives of uh, young people right so so far there is a blame on comics that it corrupts uh, youth it corrupts the children's mind and it is should not be uh, should not be taught uh, to children and it should not be read but here hatfield is making a very strict in, interesting and remarkable remark and that is that no no that's not true right that that's not something that we are uh, uh, we are going to buy this argument the interesting argument that is making is that literature like comic book right comic book like literature vice versa helps in 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 visual imagination in shaping the visual imagination of a child right it gives a different world views to the children and therefore they must be exposed to comic culture right so this is a uh, another very interesting remark that is made by hart hatfield and so far he is changing the perception the way we used to perceive comics or let's say graphic novels all right so look at the slides again and you know see that charles hatfield study 
uh, of alternative comics and emerging literature is a welcome and excellent contribution to the fast growing field of a contemporary comics scholarship. A good mix of a close reading and historical institutional analysis, alternative comics bring two important innovation uh, which both content which both concern the very status of the medium. On the one hand, the book embeds the alternative that is a creative non formulaic segment of recent graphic storytelling within the broader field of a comic industry at the season that is far from being widely shared or accepted today. On the other hand, it also refuses the more fashionable label of a graphic novel which most readers would have expected to see here. Both his stances are courageous since there has been a strong tendency to isolate the more interesting comics by withdrawing them from the low cult comics while upgrading them simultaneously as a high cult graphic novels. Yet, Hatfield demonstrates very convincingly that such a reading of alternative comics would imply a double error, not only at the level of the sociological position of the genre, but also at that of its creative output. Alternative comics, he argues, do need the comics environment and the comic industry in the very broad sense of the word. Without that industry and without that subculture, alternative comics are simply not viable. The more the global comic scene is strong and productive, in other words, the more it becomes possible, the other alternative forms emerge. Moreover, Hadfield continues the decision to uh, decision to repurpose alternative comics as novels, that is, as works whose format is no longer determined by the serial form of the comic industry that will prove a real danger, however, that will be creative as well as commercially uh, wonderful. Now, uh, how to approach alternative comics, right? That is the question that we have. And it is the most fascinating chapter of Hatfield's book that is devoted to this double issue. First, the author provides important historical evidence to make the claim that alternative comics did not start as a kind of outsider or maverick, but that they have to be interpreted at the crossroads of the subcultural spirit of the underground comics and of a new types of marketing and retailing that were being experienced in post comics era. I have deliberately uh, brought these slides uh, on your screen. Uh, keeping in the mind that uh, you need to stop the video for a second and uh, listen and read this carefully, right? Otherwise, it will be difficult to follow what Hatfield is making a point, right? He how, like, let us read it again that how the author providing an important historical evidence to make the claim that alternative comics did not start as a kind of outsider or maverick but they have to be interpreted at the crossroads of the subcultural spirit of the underground comics and I have talked about it already and of new types of marketing and retailing that were being experienced in post comics era. So, in this sense, in this sense alternative comics should be read as a crucial complement uh, to uh, for instance uh, Roger Sabin's work on a similar corpus from Routledge's adult comics, all right. And second, uh, Hatfield also manages to demonstrate the dangers of forsaking the basic feature of the industry. His point that graphic novels cannot survive outside the commercial and industrial structure of serialization is made very persuasively, at least in the North American context. In either case, Hatfield's demonstration relies upon an excellent knowledge of the historical, cultural, artistic and economic aspect of the alternative comics scene in the US, which is a real achievement given the many missing links and blank spaces in the archival data that have been conserved. This book is a 
dramatically important step in the good direction it gets completed with another study slightly different in scope and more detailed as far as the history of the genre is concerned namely Jean Pierre Gavalet's PhD dissertation Des Comics at Holmes that is a translation by Bart Beatty and Nikki uh, Gwen which I have already shown you before of comics and man a cultural history of American comic books that came out in 2009. On the other hand, Hatfield's argument, right, what he defines also the alternative comics as a form of literature, right. Look at this. This apparently very simple statement, after all, this is what all the graphic novel fans have been arguing since the very beginning, is a quite a challenge in the framework of this book, which does not deny the fundamental popular and commercial character of its corpus. Yet, if the literary aspect of the subgenre does not result from its socially upward mobility, there must be for Hatfield other and better arguments to make a plea for its literary reinterpretation. The basic claim that the author makes in this respect is that comics and not only alternative comics represent a form of literature since they suppose a form of very complex reading. Hatfield continues here, the main ideas of Esner and MacLeod, whom he criticizes at various point for accepting a ramping dichotomy between the text and the image. The viewpoint adopted by Hatfield is outspokenly semiotic, although there are almost no trace of semiotic jargon in his book. The reading of an image is no less coded uh, than that of a text. This reading transforms a comic and certainly an alternative comics whose decoding is never automatic uh, or naturalized into form of literature. Hatfield's argument according to various critics seems rather oblivious of the social implication of the notion of literature given that not everything that has to be read is literature and the practical in confusion between coded reading of image on the one hand and literature on the other hand does not seem very helpful, unless of course, one's aim is the upgrading of the genre. But this would be in contradiction with the desire to firmly root the alternative comics production within the comic industries. Nevertheless, uh, uh, this point is not too crucial to what Hatfield is doing with the work he analyzes in his book, more than half of alternative comics is devoted indeed to a close reading of some landmark publication, uh, let us say Spiegelman, Pekka, the Hernandez brothers for instance. For a European audience, the chapter will offer interesting information, but nothing more the analysis of the work by the Hernandez brothers being by for the most outstanding. The theoretical remarks on issues such as authenticity and irony are less surprising. European readers who are familiar with an alternative comics production that is much richer and infinitely more variegated than the US one and who may be used to the implementation of literary theory in reading of a comics may consider them too general or too much content oriented. It would be unfair to make this kind of a reproach to a book that fills a gap in our current knowledge of what goes beyond the mere graphic novel. According to Hatfield, now I uh, will give you something quick bullet point that will uh, be uh, key to understand. According to Hatfield, alternative comics differ from mainstream comics in several ways. Now uh, note down each one of them because that is extremely helpful right, what is alternative comics and what is a mainstream comics. Alternative comics are more autobiographical, emotionally realistic, experimental than mainstream comics, right. Alternative comics are not eschatological satires, brightly colored newspaper strips or superhero comic books, right, that is a second point. Third, Alternative comics are distinguished from commercialized mainstream 
comics by their concept and characteristics. All right. Alternative comics resist commercialized mainstream culture and play a vital role in revealing the contradiction and vulnerabilities of society's dominant value system and mainstream culture. Alternative comics pursue diversity and cultural expression of various minority groups. Alternative comics, right? Uh, alternative comics pursue, uh, uh, I mean, they reveal uh, the practical capabilities to overcome discrimination and hatred against social minorities. Mainstream comics tend to use a more regular grid than alternative comics which adopt a more fluid form of the grid typical of a manga style. Alternative comics are characterized by their use of a language including uh, sound effects which vary between genres and culture. So, in summary what we can say alternative comics uh, differ, they differ from the mainstream comics in terms of a language, in terms of a style, in terms of a form, in terms of expression and in terms of exploring the theme. So, in this way uh, alternative comics are different from mainstream comics. See, uh, the history is uh, very long to speak about that how a particular uh, form, cultural form in any other way dominate, right. And alternative is something that is not, a, they, like alternative is something which comes up with a different voice which was not accepted, legitimized in the mainstream comics, which did not allow uh, alternative voices to emerge. So, they are something speaks which were never spoken by mainstream comics. So, that is why in all the bullet points, what I showed it to you that when you think about alternative comics, you have to think that no, 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 no it is just not about the superhero. No, 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 no. It is something new. It is something different. It is about maybe about a superhero who is like a human. Yes, that is alternative comics. Alternative comics is a different kind of cultural expression which concerns minorities, right. So, let us say for example, it is not always talking about white race. It is possible that it, that the hero may be from the black race, right. It is also possible that when we are reading uh, alternative comics, the expression is given to the different forms of sexuality which was, uh, which were uh, 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 never accepted in the mainstream comics, right. So, <coughs> these are the main <coughs> departure you could see from mainstream comics to the alternative comics. So, I am sure that you will keep uh, this in mind. So, moving to the next slide that you see on your screen that uh, some notable uh, creator in the alternative comic scenes are as follows. Let me uh, tell you who are these people who are known for developing uh, alternative comics, right. And I am sure that uh, 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 you have already uh, read about them like we have discussed about them, but just to tell you that if you think about alternative comics and see what is the best way also to relate with ki who are uh, the people who generated this very idea of alternative comics, right. So, you can go back to those, uh, uh, those artists who have talked about these things and when you already know the name of those comic artists, it becomes very easy and smooth for you to think about the feature of alternative comics. So, uh, look at your slides now and the first one that you have on your screen, you see the slide and you see that Gilbert, Zem and Mario Hernandez, right. Uh, I mean uh, before them, I would like to name very uh, important one, Art Spiegelman, right, who created Mouse, a Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel that tells the story of his father's experience during the Holocaust. And here we have the second one, uh, I mean Gilbert, Zem and uh, Mario Hernandez who created Love 
and uh, rockets. It is a series of uh, a comic book uh, that explores her relationship with her father and uh, uh, in fact uh, her own uh, uh, sorry uh, I mean sorry 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 uh, I mean uh, it's a series of a comic book that explores the lives of a group of uh, let me write it for you Latino characters right and now you see if you think about all the mainstream uh, uh, comic artist you will uh, see that Latino characters were hardly uh, talked about right. So, these are the people who are exploring that and then we have uh, 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 in fact these uh, Latino characters right where are these uh, uh, figuring central American town right and then we have Alison Bechdel who created a, a fun home we all know right a graphic memoir that explores her relationship with her father and her own sexuality. Remember these names and then we have a, a Harvey Picker right who created American Splendor, a series of uh, autobiographical comic book that explore his life as a file clerk in Ohio, in Cleveland, Ohio. Then we have uh, Robert Crumb, right? Robert Crumb, uh, who is known for his underground comics, and uh, he satirizes American culture and. Uh, explore uh, taboo subjects right and uh, <clears throat> then we have a uh, uh, Linda Barry right who created uh, let me write it for you you can note down Ernie Pooks comic right. Uh, so, a comic strip that explores the lives of uh, working class characters right working class characters and uh, in a fictional middle midwestern town and then we have Adrian Tomney. Adrian Tomney right and who created optic now and uh, a series of comic book that explores the life of uh, lives of a young people in urban setting and we all know a person Chris Ware right who created a uh, uh, Jimmy Corrigan right these are the uh, Jimmy Corgan, the smartest kid on the earth. This is a basically a graphic novel that explores uh, the life of a lonely man and uh, his uh, 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 his uh, family history. Right. So here you see almost I told you eight names and their work, who are uh, very much uh, closely associated with alternative comics. And if we uh, see their works and if we uh, read their works, interestingly what we see they are all talking something, exploring something, discussing something which was uh, uh, which were never explored for us, right. So, someone is working on Latino characters, so someone is working on working class, someone is exploring taboo subjects, right. So, you see this is a married themes and issues which were uh, never explored and is being discussed first time. So, whenever you think of alternative comics obviously not a mainstream comics I would request you that read Art Spiegelman I am sure that we have already discussed Mosh read these works you will yourself understand what we mean by alternative comics alright. So, look at the slides now and you see that uh, we are going to talk now Neil Cohen 
is a American cognitive scientist right uh, and a comic theorist who has dedicated his career to studying the relationship between visual language, comics and linguistics right. Uh, Let us uh, 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 know about uh, Neil Cohen. He has been uh, fascinated with drawing and comics since he was a child and uh, uh, has worked for Image Comics and Todd McFarlane production at the San Diego Comic Con. He received his uh, PhD in psychology from the Tufts University and did his postdoctoral research at UC San Diego right as you could see on the screen. Currently, he is an associate professor at the Tilburg Center for Cognition and Communication at the Tilburg University in the Netherlands. His research offers the most serious scientific study of the cognition of understanding comics and he uses an interdisciplinary approach right combining aspects of a theoretical and corpus linguistic with cognitive psychology and cognitive neuroscience. So, that is uh, interesting uh, find in his work that he is going to bring interdisciplinary approach to combine uh, aspects of uh, uh, let us say linguistic uh, psychology and obviously uh, neuroscience right. So, speaking uh, during a roundtable discussion at the end of 2014, International uh, Graphic Novel and Comic Conference in London, cultural theorist Scout Bucketman suggested it was a cause for optimism that MacLeod had not been mentioned at every turn during the event. So, no disrespect appeared to be intended, but Bucketman saw it as a welcome sign that the field of comic studies was finding new areas of expression and exploration. Following a similar path right, Neil Cohn the author of the visual language of a comics uh, introduction to the structure and cognition of sequential images has described how he studied and attempted to, to, to expand upon MacLeod's concept of a panel transition. Right? but began to feel that comics need needed a far more complex framework of a definition and this led to uh, uh, this led con to apply aspects of linguistics to his research on sequential images and his book collects much of his work from the past 10 years. So, I would uh, uh, request you that uh, read this one by Neil Cohen, the visual language of a comics introduction to the structure and cognition of a sequential images, right. So, although uh, not as a affably expressed as MacLeod's understanding comics, Cohen declares in his introduction that he intends to avoid what he calls academic good boy gook published as a part of the Bloomsbury advances in semiotic series. Uh, the visual language of a comics does inevitably contain an era of linguistic terminology among the commentary and comic strip illustration, but Cohen gives clear definition that allow those without a linguistic background to grasp his theories. Indeed, an inadvertent effect of the book could be to provide an introduction to some theories and debates in the field of linguistic for the primarily comic focused student. While identifying that renowned creators such as Jack Kirby and Osamu Tezuka have instinctively compared their comic work to form of linguistic expression. Let me write the name Jack Kirby and then Osamu Tejuka, all right. So, uh, these are the two names that you see and interestingly what is the point that Cohn insist almost refuting uh, 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 the primary claim of theory Gristein's that comics are not a language. So, here you see 
that Cohen is like refuting the primary claim of a theory Greenstein that comics are not a language. In the book, this is printed in bold, italicized with underscore the, the abundance of a typographic emphasis signaling just statement is to the author and his approach. It also any potential ambiguity surrounding the title of the book refers to the visual language that can be found types comics as a socio-cultural expression of a visual language. Novel in English is a manifestation a verbal language. So, see here are uh, something brought for you, right. So, what we interestingly see that Granistein not a language is being reputed by Cohen, right. Uh, noticing here that uh, something new is coming up and therefore, it is almost uh, uh, that the, with the same spirit the way we read Granist also uh, uh, Cohen and other people right and what that the new kind of expression was emerging right explored new way of a telling is being by a uh, new comic writers all right so cultural expression like how through the visual how through the visuals cultural expression is made and he saying that we must read it like writings right. So, no one is on the dissensus, but method the process uh, the artistic device of these methods to read these uh, books all right. So, I will continue from here uh, and we will talk more I'll read this so that when I am talking further you can relate. I am ending this lecture here, so that when the next lecture comes up, you are already familiar with these people, you are already in the mind, so that you can easily grasp them. Alright, so, okay, bye bye, see you soon.